Thank you. As I've mentioned, I think every time I've come here, I grew up not far from here in Schoharie, Schoharie, New York, on Main Street. My father had the old red brick church, and we grew up in the house next door. I'm a slouter at heart. I have to be from Schoharie Valley to know what that is. <clears throat> the French sociologist Emile Durkheim in his book on suicide, examined the disintegration of social bonds that drive individuals and societies to personal and collective acts of self-destruction. He found that when social bonds were strong, individuals achieve a healthy balance between individual initiative self-actualization, and communal solidarity, which he called a life-sustaining equilibrium. These individuals and communities, he noted, have the lowest rates of suicide. The individuals and societies most susceptible to self-destruction, he wrote, are those for whom these social bonds this equilibrium have been shattered. Societies are held together by a web of social bonds that give individuals a sense of being part of a collective and engaged in a project larger than the self. This collective expresses itself through meaningful work, democratic participation, worship, and even patriotism as well as shared national beliefs and values. These social bonds provide meaning, a sense of purpose, status, and dignity. They offer psychological protection from impending mortality and the meaningless that comes with being isolated and rejected. The disintegration of these social bonds plunges individuals into deep psychological distress that leads ultimately to acts of collective and individual self-annihilation. Durkheim called this state of hopelessness and despair, anime, which he defined as rulelessness. Rulelessness means the norms that govern a society and create a sense of organic solidarity no longer function. The belief, for example, that if we work hard, obey the law, and get a good education, we can achieve stable employment, social status, and mobility, along with financial security, is no longer true. The old rules, that were imperfect and usually excluded poor people of color, nevertheless were not a complete fiction in the United States. They offered some Americans, especially those from the white working and middle class, modest social and economic advancement. But the capture of political and economic power by corporate elites along with the redirecting of all institutions toward the further consolidation of their power and wealth, has broken the social bonds that held American society together. This rupture has unleashed a widespread malaise and self-destructiveness that Durkheim would have recognized. When society is strongly integrated, he wrote, it keeps individuals in a state of dependency, holding them to be in its service and consequently not permitting them to dispose of themselves as they wish. Society is thus opposed to them escaping from their obligations toward it through death. The bond that attaches them to their common purpose attaches them to life. 
and in any case the high goal towards which their gaze is turned alleviates the suffering that they feel from life's troubles. Finally, in a coherent and vital community, there is a continual exchange of ideas and feelings from all to each and from each to all, which is like a mutual moral support so that the individual, instead of being reduced to his or her resources only, participates in the collective energy and draws on it when his own is extinguished. Our corporate coup d'etat and failed democracy has freed the oligarchic elite from all legal and moral constraints. The state of disorganization or anime is thus reinforced by the fact that passions are less disciplined at the very time when they need stronger discipline, Durkheim noted, of the avarice of the rich. It is not for nothing that so many religions have celebrated the benefits and the moral value of poverty, Durkheim wrote. This is because of all schools, it is the one that best teaches humankind to restrain itself by obliging us to exercise constant discipline over ourselves, it prepares us to accept collective discipline with docility, while wealth, by exalting the individual, constantly risks awakening the spirit of rebellion that is the very font of immortality. Professors Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, in their study of legislative laws wrote, the central point that emerges from our research is that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policy, while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have little or no independent influence. In essence, the electoral process is a facade, one where, as we will see this week, we get to choose between the friendly and inclusive form of corporate fascism under the Democratic Party or the raw, racist, Christian fascism of Donald Trump's white man's party. The economic structures, like the political structures, have been reconfigured to keep the working class in a state of constant distress. American productivity, as the New York Times pointed out, has increased 77% since 1973. But hourly pay has grown only 12%. If the federal minimum wage was attached to productivity, the newspaper noted, it would be more than $20 an hour, not $7.25. Some 41.7 million workers, a third of the American workforce, earn less than $12 an hour, and most of them do not have access to employer-sponsored health insurance. A decade after the 2008 financial meltdown, the Times wrote, the average middle-class family's net worth is more than $40,000 below what it was in 2007, and the net worth of black families is down 40%, and for Latino families, the figure has dropped to 46%. The financial crisis of 2008 saw the world's central banks, including the Federal Reserve, inject trillions of dollars of fabricated money into the global financial system. The Federal Reserve, which is supposed to regulate banks alone, handed over an estimated $29 trillion of fabricated money to American banks according to researchers at the University of Missouri. $29 trillion. Kevin Zees and Margaret Flowers on the website Popular Resistance wrote, one-sixth of this 
could provide a $12,000 annual basic income, which would cost $3.8 trillion annually, doubling Social Security payments to $22,000 annually, which would cost $662 billion, a $10,000 bonus for all U.S. public school teachers, which would cost $11 billion, free college, for all high school graduates, which would cost $318 billion, and universal preschool, which would cost $38 billion. National Improved Medicare for All would actually save the nation trillions of dollars over a decade. Now, the Fed and other central banks cut interest rates to near zero. And indeed, some central banks in Europe instituted negative interest rates, meaning they would pay borrowers to take loans. The Fed, in a clever bit of accounting, even permitted distressed banks to use these no-interest loans to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. So the banks gave the bonds back to the Fed and received a quarter of a percent interest from the Fed. In short, the banks were loaned money at virtually no interest by the Fed and then were paid interest by the Fed on the money they borrowed. The Fed also bought up worthless derivatives and other to toxic assets from the banks. Since Fed authorities could fabricate as much money as they wanted, it did not matter if what they were buying was worthless. This fabricated money over the last decade has created a worldwide debt of $325 trillion, more than three times global GDP. The fabricated money was hoarded by banks and corporations, loaned by banks at predatory interest rates, used to service interest on unsustainable debt, or spent buying back stock, providing billions in compensation for the ruling elites. The fabricated money was not provided to the victims of financial fraud, but the victimizers. It was not invested in the real economy. Products were not manufactured and sold. Workers were not reinstated into the middle class with sustainable incomes, benefits, and pensions. Infrastructure projects were not undertaken. The fabricated money re-inflated massive financial bubbles built on debt, and papered over a fatally diseased financial system destined again for collapse. The criminal irresponsibility of the elites was simply perpetrated on an even more massive scale. What will trigger the next crash? The $13.2 trillion in US household debt the $1.5 trillion in student debt, the billions Wall Street has invested in a fracking industry that has spent $280 billion more than it generated from its operations, who knows? What is certain is that a global financial crash, one that will dwarf the meltdown of 2008, is inevitable. But this time, with interest rates near zero, the elites have no plan B. The financial structure will disintegrate and the global economy will go into a death spiral. The rage of a betrayed and impoverished population will, I fear, further empower right-wing demagogues who promise vengeance, vengeance on the global elites, moral renewal, and a nativist revival heralding a return to a mythical time when immigrants, women, and people of color knew their place, and most probably in the United States, a Christianized fascism. Given the staggering amount of fabricated money that has to be repaid, the, bets, the banks need to build greater and greater pools of debt. This is why when you are late, in paying your credit card, the interest rates jump to 28%. This is why if you declare bankruptcy, you are still responsible for paying off student loans 
even as one million people a year default on these loans, with 40% of all borrowers expected to default by 2023. This is why wages are stagnant or have declined, while costs from healthcare and pharmaceutical products to bank fees and basic utilities keep skyrocketing. This is why the federal government, further stripped of $1.5 trillion over the next decade by the Trump tax cuts, will soon pay more in interest on its debt than it spends on the military, Medicaid, or children's programs combined. Within a decade, more than $900 billion in interest payments will be due annually. Interest on debt is now the fastest growing major government expense. The cost of interest will hit $390 billion next year, nearly 50% more than in 2017, according to the Congressional Budget Office. The global financial system is a ticking time bomb. The question is not if it will explode, but when it will explode. And once it does, the inability of the global speculators to use fabricated money with zero interest to paper over the debacle will trigger massive unemployment, high prices for imports and basic services, and very probably a devaluation of the dollar, especially when it is dropped as the world's reserve currency. No one knows when this will happen, although the historian Alfred McCoy says the American empire as we know it will no longer exist by 2030. The manufactured financial tsunami will transform the United States, already a failed democracy, into an authoritarian police state awash in weapons and driven by hate. Life will become cheap, especially for the vulnerable, undocumented workers, Muslims, poor people of color, girls and women, anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist critics branded as agents of a foreign power. All will be demonized and persecuted for the collapse. And the ruling elites in a desperate bid to cling to their unchecked power and obscene wealth will sanction indiscriminate violence against any group or individual they fear could instigate a revolt. Empires in decay ravaged by widespread enemy, embrace an almost willful suicide. Blinded by their hubris and unable to face the reality of their diminishing power, they retreat into a fantasy world where hard and unpleasant facts no longer intrude. They replace diplomacy, multilateralism, and participatory politics with a constant mobilization against enemies real or invented. This self-delusion saw the United States make the greatest strategic blunder in its history, one that sounded the death knell of the empire, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. The architects of the war in the George W. Bush White House and the array of useful idiots in the press and academia who were cheerleaders for it, all of whom kept their prominent public platforms, knew very little about the countries being invaded, were stunningly, stunningly naive about the effects of industrial warfare, and were blindsided by the ferocious blowback. They stated and probably believed that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, although they had no valid evidence to support this claim. They insisted that democracy would be implanted in Baghdad and spread across the Middle East. They assured the public that US troops would be greeted by grateful Iraqis and Afghans as liberators. They promised that the oil revenues would cover the cost of reconstruction. They insisted that the bold and quick military strike, shock and awe, would restore American hegemony in the region and dominance in the world. It did the opposite. Historians of empire call these military fiascos a feature of all late empires, micro-militarism. 
The Athenians engaged in micro-militarism when during the Peloponnesian War they invaded Sicily, suffering the loss of 200 ships and thousands of soldiers and triggering revolts throughout the empire. Britain engaged in micro-militarism in 1956 when it attacked Egypt in a dispute over the nationalization of the Suez Canal and then quickly withdrew in humiliation, empowering a string of Arab nationalist leaders such as Gamal Abdel Nasser, and dooming the British rule over the nation's few remaining colonies. Neither of these empires recovered. Empires, because they rely on the power to dominate and exploit other countries, are in fact very fragile, and once this ability to dominate is taken from them, they unravel swiftly. A year for Portugal, two years for the Soviet Union, eight years for France, 11 years for the Ottomans, 17 for Great Britain, and in all likelihood, 27 years for the United States, counting from the crucial 2003 when the US invaded Iraq. Empires at the same time hollow themselves out from the inside. Their cities fall into decay. The decline sees the brutality abroad matched by a brutality at home. Militarized police gun down mostly unarmed poor people of color and fill a system of penitentiaries and jails that hold a staggering 25% of the world's prisoners, although the America represents only 5% of the global population. The population at home, like the subjugated population abroad, lives under wholesale surveillance. Public services, including public education, infrastructure, public transportation, become decrepit and dysfunctional. This rulelessness, this enemy, is best seen in the two strata of the nation's judiciary. There is an aggressive criminalization of the poor, while the ruling elites are given virtual immunity. Protected by high-priced lawyers and non-enforcement or rewriting of laws. Amid selective enforcement of laws in the ruleless society, the high rollers on Wall Street and in wealthy enclaves are not prosecuted for possessing and ingesting illegal drugs, but the poor are thrown into prison and must forfeit all their property for being caught with small amounts of the same drugs. I live in Princeton, New Jersey, and I am sure there are as many drugs and probably of better quality in Princeton than there are in Trenton or in Troy. But police in Kevlar vests, armed with long-barreled weapons, are not kicking in Princeton doors at two in the morning to terrorize families over a nonviolent drug warrant. HSBC, the world's seventh largest bank by total assets, after admitting to laundering $800 million for Central and South American drug cartels, was slapped with symbolic fines and a deferred prosecution agreement, which is the legal equivalent of a get out of jail free card. The poor, meanwhile, are hounded, arrested, and fined for absurdly criminalized activities such as not mowing their lawns, loitering, selling loose cigarettes, although Eric Garner was not when he was murdered selling loose cigarettes, carrying open containers of alcohol or obstructing pedestrian traffic, which means standing on a sidewalk. These fines are used to fill state and county budget shortfalls resulting from corporations and the wealthy fixing the rules to avoid paying meaningful taxes if they pay taxes at all. And remember, under Eisenhower, the wealthiest individuals and corporations paid 91%. This virtual tax boycott by the rich has broken yet another vital social bond. The idea that everyone contributes a significant portion of his or her income 
to make the society function. The elites who sacrifice nothing for society and are not held accountable for their criminal behavior live in what Matt Taibbi calls a stateless archipelago, or what a writer for the New Yorker called Richistan. They are legally empowered to pillage the nation, amass obscene wealth, and wield unchecked political and legal control. Brett Kavanaugh, aside from most probably being a sexual predator, is, as Ralph Nader said, a corporation masquerading as a human being. The result has been the obliteration of the primary social bonds that, however biased in favor of the white majority, once held the nation together. The shattering of these bonds has left tens of millions of Americans adrift. Society, Durkheim wrote, is no longer sufficiently present for these individuals. Those cast aside can participate in the society, as Durkheim wrote, only through sadness. The self-destructive pathologies that plague the United States, opioid addiction, morbid obesity, gambling, suicide, sexual sadism, we are a pornified culture, hate groups, and mass shootings rise out of this enemy. And my new book, America, the Farewell Tour, is an examination of these pathologies and that enemy that fuels this self-destructiveness. Now, Durkheim noted that the poor have lower rates of suicide. The poor know the rules are rigged against them. James Baldwin made much the same point when he wrote that African-American men are less prone to a midlife crisis than white American men because they are less susceptible to the myth of the American dream. Most African-Americans learn very early in life that there are two sets of rules, one for blacks and one for whites. But white Americans, because of white supremacy, are more susceptible to the myth and therefore more infuriated when the myth is exposed as a lie. And this, I suspect, is why nearly all mass shootings and all members of right-wing hate groups, along with a majority of supporters of Donald Trump, are white men. Capitalism, Durkheim wrote, is antithetical to creating, sustaining the relationships that are vital to social bonds. Capitalism rewards those for whom relationships are transactional and temporary. Relationships under capitalism are mercenary. They are part of the scheme for personal advancement and require the oily manipulation of others. To advance in a capitalist system, it is necessary to build and then discard a series of ultimately hollow relationships. These empty relationships, and you can see them inside any corporation, contribute to the collective anime and disintegration of social bonds. Now, capitalism may cater to a natural desire, among many, for self-enrichment. But you don't want this greed to dominate society. Capitalism rewards single-minded narcissists and often con artists, devoid of empathy and incapable of remorse. It rewards those focused exclusively on personal gain and self-aggrandizement. Once a capitalist class achieves complete control, as it has in the United States, it dismantles the structures that make social bonds possible, seeing in them an impediment to profit the more concentrated wealth becomes. As with corporate capitalism, the more damage it inflicts on society, sending jobs to overseas sweatshops and leaving Americans underemployed or unemployed. Karl Marx saw alienation as a positive force, one that estranged workers from the means of production and moved them to question the structures, structures of power educate themselves about their exploitation and ultimately revolt. 
But for Durkheim, this alienation or enemy is debilitating. It is, he wrote, a collective asthenia that drains us of energy and will. It manifests itself in self-loathing. We may indeed understand what is happening around us, Durkheim argued, but we lack the ability to free ourselves from the despair, frustration, and rage that cripple our lives. Our actions require an object outside of themselves, Durkheim wrote. It is not because we need to sustain the illusion of some impossible immortality. It is because it is implicit in our moral being, and it cannot be lost even partially, without that moral being losing its reason for existence. There is no need to demonstrate that in such a state of collapse, the slightest cause for depression can easily give rise to desperate acts. When life is not worth living, everything becomes a pretext for ridding ourselves of it. For individuals are too closely involved in the life of society for it to be sick. Without their being affected, Durkheim wrote, its suffering inevitably becomes theirs. Trump is not a product of the leak of the Podesta emails or James Comey or even racism, although he and many who support him are racist, or Russian bots. Demagogues always arise from failed democracies, plagued by rulelessness, by enemy. They tell an enraged population what it wants to hear, and crudely, to the delight of the betrayed, ridicule the elites who sold them out. Removing Trump from office without confronting the enemy that defines the lives of tens of millions of Americans would do nothing to restore democracy. In fact, it would probably consolidate the power of a Christianized fascism, rapidly filling Trump's ideological void. Vice President Mike Pence, because he is a creature of the Christian right, would most likely, as Noam Chomsky has pointed out, be worse than Trump if he gained the presidency. This enemy, as it always does, has empowered our own demagogues. And demagogues must be understood as cult leaders rather than traditional politicians. A disempowered population, infantilized by a world it cannot control, gravitates to cult leaders who appear omnipotent and promise a return to a mythical golden age. The cult leaders vow to crush the forces embodied in demonized groups and individuals which are blamed for their misery. The more outrageous the cult leaders become, the more they flout law and social conventions, the more they gain in popularity. Cult leaders are immune to the norms of established society. This is their appeal. Cult leaders demand a godlike power. Those who follow them grant them this power in the hope that the cult leaders will save them. Trump has transformed the decayed carcass of the Republican Party into a cult. And all cults are personality cults. They are extensions of the cult leader. The cult reflects the leader's prejudices, worldview, personal style, and idiosyncrasies. Trump did not create the yearning for a cult leader. Huge segments of the population, betrayed by the established elites, were conditioned for a cult leader. They were desperately looking for someone to rescue them and solve their problems. They found their cult leader in the New York real estate developer and reality television show star. And only when we recognize Trump as a cult leader and many of those who support him as cult followers will we understand where we are headed and how we must resist. It was 40 years ago this month 
that a messianic preacher named Jim Jones convinced or forced more than 900 of his followers, including roughly 280 children, to die by ingesting a cyanide-laced drink. Trump's refusal to acknowledge and address the impending crisis of ecocide and the massive mismanagement of the economy by the kleptocrats, his bellicosity, his threats against Iran and China, the withdrawal from nuclear arms treaties, along with his demonization of all who oppose him, ensure our cultural, and if left unchecked, physical extinction. Cult leaders are driven at their core by the death instinct, the instinct to annihilate and destroy rather than nurture and create. Trump shares many of the characteristics of Jones as well as other cult leaders, such as the founders of the Heaven's Gate cult, the Reverend Sun Young Moon, who led the Unification Church, and David Koresh, who led the Branch Davidian cult in Waco, Texas. Cult leaders are narcissists. They demand obsequious fawning and total obedience. They prize loyalty above competence. They wield absolute control. They do not tolerate criticism. They are deeply insecure, a trait they attempt to cover up with bombastic grandiosity. They are amoral and emotionally and physically abusive. They see those around them as objects to be manipulated for their own empowerment, enjoyment, and often sadistic entertainment. All those outside the cult are branded as forces of evil, prompting an epic battle whose natural expression is violence. A cult is a mirror of what is inside the cult leader, Margaret Singer wrote in Cults in Our Midst. He has no restraints on him. He can make his fantasies and desires come alive in the world he creates around him. He can lead people to do his bidding. He can make the surrounding world his world. What most cult leaders achieve is akin to the fantasies of a child at play, creating a world with toys and utensils. In that play world, the child feels omnipotent and creates a realm of his for a few minutes or a few hours. He moves the toy dolls about. They do his bidding. They speak his words back to him. He punishes them any way he wants. He is all powerful and makes his fantasy come alive. When I see the sand tables and the collections of toys some child therapists have in their offices, I think that a cult leader must look about and place people in his created world much as a child creates on a sand table a world that reflects his or her desires and fantasies. The difference is that the cult leader has actual humans doing his bidding as he makes a world around him that springs from inside his own head. George Orwell understood that cult leaders manipulate followers primarily through language, not force. This linguistic manipulation is a gradual process. It is rooted in continual mental chaos and verbal confusion. Lies, conspiracy theories, outlandish ideas and contradictory statements that defy reality and fact soon paralyze the opposition. The opposition with every attempt to counter this absurdism with the rational, such as the decision by Barack Obama to make his birth certificate public or by Senator Elizabeth Warren to release the results of her DNA test to prove she has Native American ancestry plays to the cult leader. The cult leader does not take his or her statements seriously and often denies ever making them, even when they are documented. Lies and truth do not matter. The language of the cult leader is designed exclusively to appeal to the emotional needs of those in the cult. Hitler kept his enemies in a state of constant confusion and diplomatic upheaval, Eust Merleau wrote in The Rape of the Mind. They never knew what this unpredictable madman was going to do next. Hitler was never logical because he knew that what, was that, that, that was what he was expected to be. Logic 
can be met with logic, while illogic cannot. It confuses those who think straight. The big lie and monotonously repeated nonsense have more emotional appeal in a cold war than logic and reason, while the enemy is still searching for a reasonable counter-argument to the first lie, the totalitarian can insult him, assault him with another. Cult leaders engage in the permanent lie. And the permanent lie is different from the falsehoods and half-truths uttered by politicians such as Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, or Barack Obama. The common political lie these politicians employed was not designed to cancel out reality. It was a form of manipulation. Clinton, when he signed into law the North American Free Trade Agreement, promised, and I'm quoting, NAFTA means jobs, American jobs, and good paying American jobs. George W. Bush, justified the invasion of Iraq because Saddam Hussein supposedly possessed weapons of mass destruction. But Clinton did not continue to pretend that NAFTA was beneficial to the working class when reality proved otherwise. Bush did not pretend that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction once none were found. The permanent lie, however, is not circumscribed by reality. It is perpetuated even in the face of overwhelming evidence that discredits it. It is irrational. Those who speak in the language of truth and fact are attacked as liars, traitors, and purveyors of fake news. They are banished from the public sphere once totalitarian elites accrue sufficient power. The iron refusal by those who engage in the permanent lie to acknowledge reality, no matter how transparent, reality becomes, creates a collective psychosis. The result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lie will now be accepted as truth and truth will be defamed as a lie, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world and the category of truth versus falsehood is among the mental means to this end is being destroyed, Hannah Arendt wrote. The permanent lie is the apotheosis of totalitarianism. It no longer matters what is true, it matters only what is correct. And federal courts are being stacked with Federalist Society judges who served the correct ideology of corporatism and the rigid social mores of the Christian right. They hold reality, including science and the rule of law, in contempt. They seek to banish those who live in a reality-based world defined by intellectual and moral autonomy. Consistency is discarded. Complexity, nuance, depth, and profundity are replaced with the simpleton's belief in threats and force. This is why the Trump administration disdains diplomacy and is dynamiting the State Department. Totalitarianism, wrote the novelist and social critic Thomas Mann, is at its core the desire for a simple folktale. Once this folktale replaces reality, morality and ethics are abolished. And as Voltaire reminded us, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. The cult leader grooms followers to speak in the language of hate and violence. The cult leader constantly paints a picture of an existential threat often invented that puts the cult followers in danger. Trump is doing this by demonizing the caravan of some 4,000 immigrants, most from Honduras, moving through southern Mexico. Caravans of immigrants are in fact nothing new. The beleaguered and impoverished asylum seekers, including many families with children, are 1,000 miles from the Texas border. But Trump, aided by nonstop coverage by Fox News and Christian broadcasting, is using the caravan to terrify his followers, just as he, 
along with these media outlets, portrayed the protesters who flocked the US Capitol to oppose the nomination of Kavanaugh as unruly mobs. Trump claims the Democrats want to open the border to these quote unquote criminals and to quote unquote unknown Middle Easterners who are, he suggests, radical jihadists. Christian broadcasting such as Pat Robertson's 700 Club splice pictures of marching jihadists in black uniforms cradling automatic weapons into video shots of the caravan. The fear mongering and rhetoric of hate and violence as I saw when I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia eventually leads to widespread acts of violence against those the cult leader defines as the enemy. The explosive devices sent to Trump critics and leaders of the Democratic Party, including Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, along with George Soros, James Clapter, and CNN, allegedly by Cesar Sayoc, an ex-stripper and fanatic Trump supporter who was living out of his van, herald more violence. Trump, tossing gasoline on the flames, used this assault against much of the leadership of the Democratic Party to again attack the press, or as he calls it, the enemy of the people. It should come as no surprise that last Saturday, another enraged American white male, his fury and despair seemingly stoked by the diatribes and conspiracy theories of the far right, entered a Pittsburgh synagogue and massacred eight men and three women as he shouted, anti-Semitic abuse. Shot by police and arrested at the scene was Robert Bowers, who believes that Jewish groups are aiding the caravan of immigrants in southern Mexico. He was armed with a military-style AR-15 assault rifle, plus three handguns. The proliferation of easily accessible, high-caliber weapons, coupled with the division of the country into the blessed, and the damned by Trump and his fellow cultists threatens to turn the landscape of the United States into one that resembles Mexico, where at least 145 people in politics, including 48 candidates and pre-candidates, along with party leaders and campaign workers, have been assassinated over the last 12 months. Look south if you want a vision of the future. The cult leader, unlike a traditional politician, makes no effort to reach out to his opponents. The cult leader seeks to widen the divisions. The cult leader brands those outside the cult as irredeemable. The cult leader seeks the omnipotence to crush those who do not kneel in adoration. The cult followers yearning to be protected and empowered seek to give the cult leader unlimited power Democratic norms and impediment to the leader's omnipotence are ridiculed, attacked, and ultimately abolished. Those in the cult seek to be surrounded by the cult leader's magical aura. Reality is sacrificed for fantasy, and those who challenge the fantasy are not considered human. They are satanic. Behavior that ensures the destruction of a public figure's career does not affect a cult leader. It does not matter how many lies uttered by Trump are meticulously documented by the New York Times or the Washington Post. It does not matter that Trump's personal financial interests, as we see in his relationship with the Saudis, take precedence over the rule of law, diplomatic protocols, and national security. It does not matter that he is credibly charged by numerous women with being a sexual predator, a common characteristic of cult leaders. It does not matter that he paid little or no income taxes and routinely committed financial fraud. It does not matter that he is inept, lazy, and ignorant. The establishment whose credibility has been destroyed because of its complicity in empowering the ruling oligarchy and the corporate state, might as well be blowing soap bubbles at Trump. Their 
vitriol to his followers only justifies the hatred radiating from the cult. The removal of Trump from power would not remove the yearning of tens of millions of people, many conditioned by the Christian right for a cult leader. Most of the leaders of the Christian right have built cult followings of their own. These Christian fascists embraced magical thinking, attacked their enemies as agents of Satan, and denounced reality-based science and journalism long before Trump. Cults are a product of social decay, of anime, and our decay and despair are expanding, soon to explode in another financial crisis. The efforts by the Democratic Party and much of the press, including CNN and the New York Times, to discredit Trump as if our problems are embodied in him alone are futile. The smug self-righteousness of this crusade against Trump only contributes to the national reality television show that has replaced journalism and politics. This crusade attempts to reduce a social, economic, and political crisis to the person of Trump. It is accompanied by a refusal to confront and name the corporate forces responsible for our failed democracy and growing social inequality. This collusion with the forces of corporate oppression, neuters the press and Trump's mainstream and democratic critics. Our only hope is to organize for the overthrow of the corporate state that vomited up Trump. Our democratic institutions, including the legislative bodies, the courts, and the media, are hostage to corporate power. They are no longer democratic. We must, like liberation, movements of the past, engage in acts of sustained mass civil disobedience and non-cooperation by turning our ire on the corporate state, we expose and name the true sources of power and abuse. We expose the absurdity of blaming our demise on demonized groups such as undocumented workers, Muslims, African Americans, Latinos, feminists, gays, and others. We give people an alternative to a democratic party that refuses to confront the corporate forces of oppression, a party which cannot be rehabilitated. We make possible the restoration of an open society. If we fail to embrace this militancy, which alone has the ability to destroy cult leaders, we will continue the march toward tyranny. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Wow. It's a scary time that we're living in. Um, I feel scared. Uh, but I also feel really hopeful. And uh, I, I feel lucky that I get to spend my days here, which feels like a hopeful place. Uh, when I hear Chris talk, it, it harmonizes with what we're doing here really beautifully. I was. <laughs> I grabbed one of our t-shirts coming up here because this is sort of our like our trilogy right that we've we've kind of owned. It's art, science, and media. And these things are under attack, and these are this is what we do. And it's not a coincidence. Independent media, art, transgressive art, and science. The Nature Lab Center is an organic output of the people in this community who are creative smart, independent thinking, and self-reliance. This, this is really a project in, in self-reliance here. I look in the audience and I see a lot of new faces, but I also see a lot of faces who are not new, who are helping us do this work. Um, 
And I want to thank you guys uh, for being part of that organizing effort that Chris is talking about. I have not given up hope. I do not want to say farewell to America. And I, I think most of you feel the same way. And that's why we're here. Um, and so I'll just take this opportunity to ask you once again to help us do this non-corporate work that it's really hard to get funding to do by giving a little bit monthly. Sign up to be a sanctuary sustainer. There is going to be an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you have some questions, you can start lining up uh, right here by this microphone. I followed your work closely since you wrote um, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. As I sat and listened to your talk, I was reminded of a parable about a river that floods and all of the people who have to deal with the flood are rushing around frantically figuring out how they can save their houses and this and that. And someone comes along and says, work upstream. And I would just like you to comment on how to do that upstream work. I, I think at this point, um all of the economists that I admire, I'm not an economist, of course, uh, David Harvey, uh, Richard Wolff, Nomi Prinz, Michael Hudson, uh, are terrified of what's coming. And having lived through the economic collapse of Yugoslavia and watched what it did, uh, especially when Yugoslavia fell into hyperinflation, um, the, the old power structure which was largely ineffectual for the majority of the Yugoslavs, was so swiftly discredited that people turned to figures like Radovan Karadzic, who everyone knew was buffoonish, in the same way that Trump is buffoonish. And we forget that in Weimar Germany, the Nazis were considered buffoonish. I mean, Hitler couldn't even speak proper German. And you had the old German aristocracy, von Papen and others, assuring the uh, uh, the chancellor that uh, they could control them. And I wrote a book on, on the Christian right, uh, American Fascists, the Christian Right and the War in America 10 years ago, which has become, I think, very important because the Christian right is rapidly filling the ideological void that Trump has. And um, many of the antecedents for magical thinking and fake news, of course, come out of the Christian right, highly organized. Uh, Pence, of course, is a product. And in the book, uh, of course, at that time, you had a Republican Party that thought that they were manipulating and using, to use Lenin's term, the useful idiots. And I warned in the book that uh, in the end, it's the useful idiots who would take over. And that's precisely what's happened. So we live in a period of relative stability, um, but I think we have to face what's coming. Um, every climate change report, including the latest one on the oceans that came out the other day, is terrifying. It all has the same theme. And of course, what they wrote in that report is that, this was in the journal Nature, that uh, the ocean is stored far more heat than we thought, which means that it's an, even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, uh, it's going to be worse. The polar ice caps are disintegrating. Um, the weather patterns are nuts. Um, and it, it's bleak and it's frightening. And I have children. It's, it's depressing. Um, and the most, or perhaps the hardest existential crisis of this moment in American history is to face how dire our situation is and then respond. Um, but by pretending that it's not there, or pretending that we can adapt, or pretending that technology will save us, uh, essentially replicates the kind of checking out of reality that characterizes late empire, and Joseph Tainter writes about this in length in Collapse of Complex Societies, where he studies the collapse of 24 civilization. I mean, or there's, an, there's several books, Easter Island, Easter, Easter Earth, Jared Diamond's Collapse. Mm -hmm. But there, there, it comes a point when reality is so stark that people just can't look anymore. Um, but that makes it worse. And um, so yes, I think that we, 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 have, we have 
a responsibility to begin to prepare um, that clearly the already we have Trump inciting acts of violence. Um, I think it should be clear that if the Democrats retake the House, the violence will get worse and will be directed at mainstream Democratic critics. And if they don't take the House, it will get worse because Trump's policies are wildly unpopular. Nobody likes his tax cuts. Nobody wants him to destroy Obamacare. Nobody wants him to privatize Social Security. Nobody supports his refusal to raise the minimum wage. And so, and of course what he's done is turbocharge the kleptocracy. And so he will, as we have seen throughout history, um, Hegel wrote it, the, you know, the, the only thing that he said uh, past civilizations prove is that they know nothing about history. Um, we know where it's going to go. I mean, it's not a surprise. It collapse societies, many of which I covered as a war correspondent, have m many similar characteristics. In fact, what's happening now reminds me very much of the disintegration of Yugoslavia. Uh, so yeah, I think that you're right. Um, we can't be reactive. We have to be proactive because when things become rough, the elites will retreat into their gated compounds well, th where they will have access to security, uninterrupted electricity, water, uh, and medical service, and, and we'll be on our own. Thank you very much for your, uh, your brilliant use of Durkheim uh, and the overall structure. Uh, I'm, I may be wrong, but I kind of suspect that there are two names that are missing from your analysis because I think they're, they were both midwives of the uh, corporate uh, takeover uh, Reagan and Justice Powell, especially during his time with the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, well, I've written about that. Um, I, can, I can't do in 26 pages what I can do in 250 pages. Um, but you're right that that 1971 Powell memo was the blueprint for, it was a, you know, what Samuel Huntington called the excess of democracy, talking about the 60s. And uh, the elites mobilized, the corporate elites mobilized, and it's all in the Powell memo, uh, to destroy independent media, to uh, defame and discredit and marginalize. They actually name Ralph Nader in the memo to take over academia. It's why economics departments are still preaching the fantasy of neoliberalism. David Harvey wrote a very good book on neoliberalism. I, it's a short book, but it's, as far as I know, the most succinct and most thoughtful study of neoliberalism. It's called A Brief History of Neoliberalism. It, it was cooked up as an ideological veneer for uh, the destruction of democratic participation and the return of wealth and power to the hands of the oligarchy. It's not a rational economic system. Carl Polanyi in The Great Transformation, uh, written in 1944, writes about unchecked, unregulated capitalism and its consequences. And as Polanyi said, first it creates a mafia economy, that's called Goldman Sachs, uh, and then it creates a mafia political system. And Polanyi is exactly right. So, um, yeah, Reagan was a tool. Um, you know, he was like Barack Obama. Uh, he was pushed out, but Cornell calls Barack, call Barack uh, the black mascot for Wall Street. Um, I mean, the difference is Reagan was so clueless, he probably didn't know that he was being used, and Obama doesn't have an excuse. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a long process. It began in the early 70s. John Ralston Saul calls it the corporate coup d'etat in slow motion. That's exactly what happened, and it's over. They've won. I was, uh, in the body of your text, I was reflecting on the fact that the environment played so little into the initial portion, and just uh, a minute ago, you spoke a bit more to the environmental collapse that we are about to experience. 
according to the UN report, roughly at the same time as 2030 and the economic collapse. Um, I think, personally, I'm far more afraid of the environmental collapse than the economic collapse, although clearly there are enjoined, but I'm wondering why the press and our culture as a whole doesn't connect militarism and war to the environmental collapse as they are one of the greatest degraders of the environment we know. And well, they're... Because they own the press. And, you know, PBS is, is awful. PBS is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Koch brothers. We may, they may own the press, but I mean, even in environmental groups and people well, I it, speak to don't make that connection. Sure. I mean, environmental groups are also dependent upon donors. It's why environmental groups won't confront the animal agriculture industry, which is as egregious in terms of carbon emissions as the fossil fuel industry. Um, they won't go there. And so what was the big campaign? What was it, Sierra Club or somebody had? Like, don't use straws. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. Uh, so most of the NGOs are, because they're beholden to, to wealthy and corporate donors, are tepid at best and often mendacious. I mean, moveon.org, there is a classic example. So I was involved in, with Dr. Margaret Flowers and others about uh, universal health care, which Obama conspired in a back room with the insurance and pharmaceutical industry to make sure it was never raised. And uh, moveon.org uh, totally supported Obama because they said, if we don't support Obama, he won't get reelected. And that's kind of emblematic of where most of these groups are at. So there is a frightening kind of silence about the greatest existential crises that we face, financial, uh, ecological, the social malaise. I mean, uh, the opioid crisis is staggering. And I would imagine almost, I mean, I, including myself, Everyone in this room probably knows of, or at least has heard of, people who have overdosed and probably died. Uh, and, and having written about the opioid crisis in this book, and I also wrote about suicide, one of the things I found is that large numbers of families hide it. So the, there may be an opioid overdose or maybe a suicide, but the, they don't allow that information to go public. It's probably far worse than we expect. And what's fascinating about the chapter on gambling, which I wrote out of the Trump Taj, as I said, was that all 80% of all gambling in America is done on slots. And slots zone you out. You spend six, seven, eight hours on a slot machine in the same way that heroin zones you out. These are all attempts to escape from your reality. So, so as a Christian minister, I was wondering, is there any role that that uh, the Christian left may play, it, or? Well, uh, I'm not a very good Christian minister. Um, the, I mean, my problem with the liberal church, which I come out of, my father was a Presbyterian minister, although very close to the Barrigans and the Catholic worker movement, is that they've not called out the Christian fascists for who they are. Um, they are heretics. You don't have to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School, as I did, to realize that Jesus did not come to make us rich or shower us with consumer products. And the German Christian church, which was had the Nazi swastika on one side of the altar and the Christian cross on the other, is essentially been replicated in the Christian right. Um, and if you doubt me, you should listen to or watch Christian broadcasting. Um, because that alliance with Trump. People say, well, how can the Christian right be allied with Trump? And I say, well, that's a complete misreading of the Christian right. Because having been in these megachurches, the, the, these pastors replicate the narcissism, the preying on the despair for wealth, uh, which, all of which Trump does. The only difference, at least as anecdotally that I could tell, is that the sexual proclivities of the mega pastors is probably kinkier than those of Trump. Um, and the Christian church has not called these, they don't believe in heretics or the name, in the name of tolerance, a word Martin Luther King never used, 
they have given these people a kind of religious legitimacy that they should not have. Uh, and they need to be called out and named because they are, I didn't use the word fascist lightly in the book. In fact, when I finished two years of reporting and I was in the megachurches, pro-life weekends, creationist seminars, I mean, I sat there through it all. I took an evangelism explosion course with D. James Kennedy in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, very predatory, you know. No, we weren't talking about Jesus. We were talking about finding people who their spouse had just died or they just lost their job or they were new to the neighborhood. The people, you, they prey on this despair in the same way that Trump did in his casinos. And the Christian church got all caught up in uh, that boutique activism of multiculturalism and identity politics and uh, like the wider society and forgot about the primacy of economic justice uh, and in particular what was happening to poor people of color in marginal communities, they said not a word. Um, so they were integrating you know, their church hierarchies or their academic departments and they flipped the whole, I mean for instance the whole notion of feminism as being, and I love Andrea Dworkin and, and, and urge you all to read her. She's also a beautiful writer. Um, but you know, Dworkin understood that feminism is about empowering impressed women. It's not about a woman CEO or Hillary Clinton, who God help us, just when we think we put a stake through our heart, is thinking of running again. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say, you are one of my favorite American human beings on the planet. <laughs> Your astuteness just blinds me. I just cannot even understand how you can look into that maelstrom on a daily basis and still even bother to try to do anything about it. I, I really admire you for that, but here's my question. And it's a question I have pondered for the last 10 years. I've read a lot about how people believe things, how they don't believe things. But what I've come to is that we are, as Americans, the product, pure and simple, of American advertising. They reduce it down to the simplest, most explicit terms. Just do it. Coca-Cola America. And my question to you is, because you are so astute, I mean, it, I just marvel. You're, you're, you're in another planet. <laughs> but here's what I figured out, or at least I think I figured out. Most of the people that are like you are in chairmanships of departments in big universities. And they've learned the language that basically only talks to the other 35 chairmen around the country. And unfortunately, what they know never filters down to the guy in the street. My point, and what I'd like to ask you, because you are the articulate genius in my book, how do we get people to start speaking in not the same terms as Trump, but to at least think and discuss in the simplest terms, the simplest language, because that's who's out there, are the simple people, and they have swallowed the simpleton's message. You, you know and I know that they are just disgusted. They're, they're, they're in a hopeless despair. What's her name, Oakenklaus, the, uh, Strangers in Their Own Land? Did you ever read that? Yeah. But to that point, and, and, and they're just poor people that are getting screwed over, but somehow Trump can get underneath their thinking. So my, you know, how do we get to very slam bam, thank you ma'am language? So uh, you, I mean, it's a good question because you have to grasp at once that those people who are most fervently focused on destroying American democracy, what's left of it, what's left of our anemic institutions and purveyors of hate are also victims. And this was driven home to me on the book on the Christian right because I went in with, although I came out of a religious tradition, I went in with the prejudices of the religious left. And after hearing dozens of these stories of the followers of the Christian right, in places like Ohio and 
Mississippi and where their f- communities disintegrated, their families disintegrated, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, chronic underemployment, unemployment, jail time, evictions, you, you'd be heartless not to acknowledge that very real suffering. And it was kind of driven home to me. I was in Detroit with Tim LaHaye, who wrote the End Times series, and it was a conference on the End Times. So I was in this church, and people were just uh, ecstatic, would be the only word to use, over the apocalypse. And with these incredibly graphic descriptions of what the end times would be like, including the rapture, which is not in the Bible, and the blood boiling and non-believers and their eyes. And I realized that, that what drove that lust for the apocalypse was their hatred of the secular society, the reality-based world that almost destroyed them. And that what protected them was their magical thinking. That's all they had left. And you weren't going to argue them out of creationism. Uh, The only way in the book that I wrote that we will break this movement is to reintegrate these people into the economy and into the society. In essence, as Durkheim said, to rebuild those social bonds. And there's a name for this. It's called socialism. And that really means destroying the power structure of the corporate state. Uh, It means nationalizing the banks. It means nationalizing the fossil fuel industry. It means destroying the war machine and the arms industry. Uh, It means returning the internet and public broadcasting to the public. Uh, It means absolutely no money. Uh, being funneled into our system of legalized bribery. Uh, It really means destroying the system uh, because we can't, we don't have time, nor is it possible to tinker with it. Uh, And you can see it in the whole Democratic campaign at the moment because what is their core message? We are not Trump. That's it. They won't talk about the social inequality that they helped orchestrate that is driving our crisis. I mean, the whole idea of blaming this on Russian Facebook bots is in nuts. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about fake news, it's called Fox News. Um, I mean, we've been bombarded by this junk. Uh, And the whole idea that Fox News is even considered a legitimate news organization. And then you have all the, you know, sites like Breitbart and everything else. So, uh, we, we have to rise up with that kind of radicalism because it's our only hope, not just in terms of resting back control and creating an open society, but dealing with the ecocide that is now galloping us towards extinction. And you know, there's a reason climate scientists are so terrified of going above two degrees Celsius And it's called feedback loops. And they know how feedback loops work because they've studied them on planets like Venus, which used to have water and is now 800 degrees. It means this 10,000 year period, the Holocene period, in which human, since the end of the last ice age, is an anomaly in a planet that's 4.5 billion years old that created the temperate zones that allowed us to flourish as a people. I mean, the Gulf Stream has not been a permanent part of planet Earth. The, uh, and we're, we are destroying the Holocene. We are destroying the, this very fragile, peculiar moment, climatary moment that allowed us to survive. And, Once those feedback loops start, i.e. the polar ice caps are gone, uh, the acidification within the oceans, the monster storms, the flooding, everything starts feeding off of each other. And climate scientists, and you can look it up, but they've done mathematical calculations that range anywhere between a 70% die-off and complete extinction. 
That's what we're facing. And look, you know, I, I don't share American culture's mania for hope. I don't. I come out of Calvin. I uh, have a very dark view, tragic view of human nature and human potential. Um, and that's not, and I think that's not helpful. I mean, we have to wrest ourselves from the emotional highs and lows, as somebody pointed out, of consumer culture. I asked Father Daniel Berrigan uh, once, how do you define faith? And he said it's the belief that the good draws to it the good, even if all the empirical evidence around us says otherwise. The Buddhists call it karma. And that's a very different understanding. I, I've said it so many times. I don't say it anymore because I see so many smiles in the audience when people have heard it, but it is true. I stole it from Sartre, but I don't fight fascists because I'm going to win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. That there is a moral imperative to fight for life. If you want to go back to the Christian tradition that I come out of, it's called bearing the cross. And you know, we're not here that long. We're not. Uh, and we just lost our greatest contemporary theologian, James Cohn. If you have not read The Cross and the Lynching Tree, don't go on Amazon, but buy it. Um, uh, and, you know, he talked. He rooted in the often called the father of black liberation theology, but I would say I would call him the most authentically Christian theologian in America. Um, he understood, you know, that the nature of oppression uh, and that one endures, to use Faulkner's words, at the end of The Sound and the Fury. Uh, and um, it's not, in the end, what we achieve, but it is the extent to which we are able to stand up and resist. And I, as if you heard, I teach in a prison and I've seen it among my students. Um, I taught a class called Conquest. We read Open Veins of Latin America, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and C.L.R. James's great book, The Black Jacobins on the Haitian Slave Revolt, the only successful slave revolt in human history, which Haiti is still paying for. And I was in uh, Montana, and I got a phone call my hotel room. I had given them the syllabus and said, I won't be there this week. And the person on the phone said, this is the Special Investigations Division of the Department of Corrections of the state of New Jersey. Are you aware that your students just let a sit-down strike in the prison? <laughs> and I hung up the phone and I just wept because they knew even better than I what would happen, which is what did happen. Every cell was strip searched. Every student was interrogated and threaten, and you have so little in prison, that rec time, your job, your ability to take a class, until they found the leaders, and they found the leaders, and they sent them to another prison, and they are still in indefinite solitary confinement. And they rose up anyway, because they realized that that act of resistance, that moment of resistance was called freedom. And I, I don't know if we're going to succeed. I don't even know if we're going to survive as a species. But I'm not going to lie down and let them run over me. I sued Obama in federal court the moment he signed into law section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which overturns the Posse Comitatus Act, and, and, and watch Trump use it now. And nobody thought we were going to win, and we won. Ultimately, Obama appealed. I mean, uh, he, and what they do is they deny your standing. It's a long story. But they, you know, so it's law. Um, but I met with the lawyers, and we said, we're just not going to let it go. So that so much of our victories may indeed be penultimate, and yet whatever hope we have, whatever empowerment we have, whatever sense of solidarity we have will only come through acts of resistance 
and whether they succeed or not is irrelevant because we cannot, we have no time left to be tyrannized by the practical. I have children. I, I, I may fail, but I at least want my children to say he tried. And that's our job. We have destroyed life for those who come after us. And we have a moral responsibility to stand up and fight on behalf of life. That's, that, I think in that sense, I go back to my religious tradition and I draw on it, and I don't in any way think you should all become Presbyterians. <laughs> um, I was at Standing Rock. I saw the same kind of spirituality at Standing Rock. Indeed, that is what made Standing Rock so powerful. Um, and uh, shattering our complacency to carry out acts of resistance, you will find will shatter your despair and your enemy. You don't do it alone. You can't do it alone. But I, everything's on YouTube, I was with 133 veterans a few years ago protesting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in front of the White House. I was the largest mass arrest since the 1960s in front of the White House. And there were Vietnam vets, Iraqi war vets, Afghan vets, many in uniform. It was snowing. And at that moment when we walked to the White House fence where we were arrested, it was complete silence and somebody was beating a drum and almost everyone was crying because we'd all been to war. We know what war is. And as we were cuffed with our hands behind our back, it turns out that the Washington police, most of them are in the National Guard. And they would whisper, keep protesting those wars. We have far more power. They're terrified of us. They are. They're, they were terrified of Occupy Wall Street, which wasn't, I love those kids, but they're not quite as radical as they think they were. I stopped them from holding memorial for Steve Jobs in the middle of the park when he died. <laughs> They're frightened of us because nobody knows how corrupt and game the system is better than them. And it doesn't take that many of us. I mean, 3%. I watched it in Eastern Europe. I watched 500,000 people gather in Alexanderplatz night after night and bring down the Stasi state which was the most sophisticated security and surveillance state until our own. So we gotta stop fooling around with the Democratic Party and we've gotta overthrow the corporate state. I'll spell that out for the Homeland Security person in the room. Oh. <laughs> That's what it is and it's got to be nonviolent. I've had, a, as some of you know, a constant battle with the Black Bloc and Antifa over this. I just came from the West Coast, they pick at me. With, and they're all dressed in black with the, you know, the handkerchief over there. And they, every single sign reads the same, which is F.U. Chris Hedges, which kind of, I think, is an advertisement for their political sophistication. <laughs> but we're not going, they're a gift to the security and surveillance state because their goal is to demonize any resistance movement and make people afraid of it. Um, and it's gonna be ugly, and the elites are not gonna go without a fight Look at what happened at Standing Rock under Obama. 700 arrests, attack dogs, unleashed on the crowd. The crowd, all nonviolent, water protectors, sprayed, hosed down with, in sub-freezing temperatures with water laced with pepper spray. Constant infiltration, surveillance. They'll play dirty. Um, but it, it, it's the last fight we have, and it's one that if we lose, then we're not just talking about the collapse of the American empire, the extinguishing of American democracy, which, it, let me tell you, does not exist at this moment, but we're really talking about the eradication of the human race. It's that existentialist threat. And in theological terms, these corporate forces are forces of death. And, and it is for those of us who care about the sacred, we've got to stand up and put our bodies online for the forces of life.
So I'd like to echo the gratitude and admiration that the other people in this line have expressed. I'm also a longtime admirer of your work. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I don't know if you saw uh, Democracy Now! on Friday morning with Alan Nairn, um, and uh, whether or not you did, his, his argument was that you have to vote for the Democrats right now because whether or not there are war criminals in the party and whether or not there are fascistic tendencies, they're less of a threat than what Trump represents. And I think many people in this audience are struggling with that same question. And secondly, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the political science, uh, Corey Robin, who uh, works at, uh, teaches at Brooklyn College, uh, but he has expressed some skepticism about the idea that everyone in the Republican Party would like to see a overtly fascist regime come to power in the United States because they've been able to do so much with the for political forms of the republic. And in the face of that situation, I would like to know your opinion about whether or not the republic itself is something worth preserving. So on the first question, first of all, I have great admiration for Alan Nairn. But I disagree with him because what happens, and I listen to the interview as well, is that every election cycle we have very, I think, and he's a person of great courage and moral probity, telling us that we have to surrender to the Democrats. Michael Moore does this every election cycle. The problem is that politics is a game of fear. And they're not going to respond until they're frightened of us. And every election cycle, we capitulate. Um, and I, as some of you know, was Ralph Nader's speechwriter. And Ralph, and nobody's fought corporate power with more integrity and courage and persistence than Ralph Nader. No one in the United States. And Ralph locked out of the democratic process. Remember all those bills, 24 pieces of legislation, the Mine and Safety Act, the Clean Water Act, all, it was all written by Ralph and then pushed through with the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, a lot of it passed by Nixon, who was still scared of movements. As Ralph says, our last liberal president. <laughs> and um, if there's no cost, I mean, Ralph said, if we get 5, 10, 15 million people to pull out, we will put pressure on the Democratic Party so they'll have to respond. And history has shown that that is how third party movements in the United States work. Many of the ideas adopted by Roosevelt were taken from the Progressive Party, even the Communist Party. And they were frightened, we know they were frightened of movements because we have Roosevelt's private correspondence where he writes his fellow oligarchs, he uses the word, if we don't begin to respond, there will be revolution. Those are Roosevelt's words with the breakdown of capitalism in the 1930s. And so we have to give up some of our wealth in order to preserve the system. And Roosevelt said that his greatest achievement was that he saved capitalism. But without those pressures, the oligarchs would not have responded. We could have gone either way in the 30s. There was a strong fascist movement, certainly fascist, sympathetic to fascism, Henry Ford and many, many others. And we've dropped the ball we fail to make them frightened. I mean, this is the power of unions. I mean, look what's happened to the American working class with the destruction of unions. And I know unions had their problems, but what they've done in the, somebody talked about the commercial, the consumer society, it's hyper-individualism. And hyper-individualism is a form of disempowerment. And they know it. So you get to express your personal identity while you are being stripped of collective power. And I just don't, you know, I heard Alan say, you know, if we don't vote for the Democrats, we won't be able to save democracy, right? Well, I don't believe that we live in a democratic system. And I also believe that that enemy, which is about to get much worse in an economic crisis, is the engine that is driving the rise of these authoritarian or fascist movements and figures and cult leaders. And that if we don't address the enemy, we're finished, whether the Democrats take power or not. I mean, at best, the Democrats can throw up some impediments and maybe slow it, um, but it isn't going to stop. And with economic 
insecurity or you know, economic crisis, these tendencies will overwhelm all of us. And the problem is we've not offered working men and women, the working poor in this country, a meaningful alternative. The Democratic Party is not a meaningful alternative. I was in Anderson, Indiana for this book and with all the old UAW workers. This is GM, it had huge plants there, 25,000 union jobs, $25, $30 an hour, pensions, benefits, protections of the unions. NAFTA's passes, they all go to GM. They didn't just tear down the plants, they actually bulldoze them. These gigantic weed-choked lots. The city went into a death spiral. Um, the jobs went to Monterey, Mexico, where they pay Mexican workers $3 an hour without benefits. So these people voted for Sanders, but they weren't going to vote for Clinton in the general election. They voted for Trump. So I'm not denying that, that, that you know, he plays to this racist, nativist movement and indeed stokes it. But the engine of this, which is this social inequality, it's what led to Sanders' insurgency. And how did the Democratic Party respond? I think there's enough evidence to say that they stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders. And in, in all of the one-on-one -on -one polls between Trump and Sanders, he would have won. And you read the Podesta emails. I'm, I'm an investigative journalist. I see nothing wrong with leaking the Podesta emails. Uh, we got to see how two-faced Hillary Clinton was and how much money she got and how she was telling all the corporatists that she was just playing us. Uh, we know from the Podesta emails that the Clinton campaign wanted Trump. Did everything they could to make sure Trump was the nominee. So I, I'm not saying don't vote Democrat as a bloc but I'm telling you that it won't make much difference, um, that the engines of corporate power, the Democrats are the friendly face of fascism, and the Republicans are the racist, irredentist, Christianized uh, bigots, but that's it. It's, it's how you want it served up. What, you know, do you want your jailer to come from Princeton or from Liberty University? There's your choice. Well, the DSA, I mean, what's interesting about the DSA candidates is you can, the Democratic Party are working as fast as they can to buy them off. And, uh, you know, what is it, Ocasio-Ortiz has now become best friends with Pelosi. That's not a good sign. I mean, we've really got to hold fast to what we believe because, look, we're not going to garner any respect within the society if we're not willing to sacrifice and fight for what we believe. And for me, that is a complete destruction of the corporate state. Every, that we cannot advance as a society and ultimately as a species until these people are removed from power. How you doing? Thanks for being here. I'm 33. I am one of your disillusioned youth who really don't see much for himself out here. But I do feel an imperative to do something about it. But I also don't want to be violent. So that's where I see the real dilemma uh, with revolution, because most revolutions are pretty violent. And I was trying to see if you had any advice for a less violent. So most revolutions are, in fact, nonviolent. Yeah. Actually, Lenin understood this. Um, I, I mean, Lenin, who didn't have a heart. Um, and as Chomsky said, mounted a counter-revolution against the Soviets, nevertheless understood the dynamics of revolution very well. And he was constantly trying to uh, shut down anarchist violence because it was counterproductive. What happens in every revolution, if you read the theorists, Crane Brinton, Jeffrey Davies, and others, is that no revolution succeeds until a significant part of the ruling elite defects. So for instance, I was in East Germany for the revolution that overthrew the Stasi state. And Eric Honecker, who had been in power for 19 years, sent down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig with orders to fire on the crowd. 
The paratroopers got to Leipzig and the local communist authorities refused to deploy them in the streets. Honecker was out of power within a week. The same thing happened in Czechoslovakia. Once the, the Czechoslovakian police would not fire on the protesters in the Velvet Revolution, they were finished. The same thing happened in Russia, people forget. Yes, there was anarchist violence without question. But what broke the back of czarism were the bread riots in Petrograd. They sent the Cossacks who were the enforcers in to crush the bread riots and they refused and they joined the rioters. The czar abdicated on a railway siding. He didn't even get back. That's how revolutions work. And um, they, you know, I, I covered Sarajevo. I'm not a pacifist. I was in Sarajevo during the war. I covered, I used to go to Algeria where you, you know, walk into the Algiers airport and it would say, welcome to Algeria, land of a million martyrs. Uh, foreign occupiers, as we see in Iraq, or, which is us, or Afghanistan. I mean, you know, the Taliban controls more territory now than they did 17 years ago when we went in. I mean, it's good for Raytheon and Halliburton and Northrop Grumman, but it's not good for them and it's not good for us. Um, yeah, that's how revolutions work. They When a critical mass and what happens within the structures of the elite is that, that the foot soldiers will no longer protect them. So you had Iran, so the Shah fled. They had the fourth largest army in the world. The head of the armed forces goes on and said, we will no longer defend the regime. It was over. That's how revolutions work. It doesn't work by you know, walking down a street all dressed in black, throwing bricks through windows. I mean, we can't compete in the language of violence. I've been overseas, I know what special forces, we have 60,000 members of the special forces who are called death squads. And we, we have no hope if we, uh, the, the state speaks that language very, very well. That doesn't mean that they won't inflict violence as they did at Standing Rock, they will. Um, but we have to be militantly non-violent to appeal ultimately to the conscience of not only the wider public, but those within the ruling apparatus. And at that point, they're finished. Hi, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I um, I agree with much of what uh, with everything pretty much that's being said tonight, and I um, certainly I had I went to the DMV and had myself removed from the Democratic Party, and I'm officially a Green Party voter. I voted for Jill Stein, and um, I never thought in a million years I'd ever do that. <laughs> um, and um, before then, I voted I um, supported Bernie Sanders, and. Um, uh, and actually, last year I went on a road trip and I had a Bernie Sanders bumper sticker on my car and a big Bernie Sanders poster on the back of my car and I was going through Kansas and Missouri and people were very hostile to me and I actually, one truck driver tried to run me off the road and he ended up with a flat tire so the joke was on him. So maybe there is a God. Um, but anyway, um, and most people I meet, you know, they act like they think I'm crazy when I try to talk about these things. They think I'm a conspiracy theorist and I'm talking about the men in black and <laughs> things like that. So I just wonder if you um, know of any uh, or have any ideas on how we could sort of all, all those of us who do think this way and are concerned about these issues, how we could come together and form communities. I know there's, there's actually a Facebook group for <laughs> Chris Hedges. Um, Facebook group, no, probably not yours, but you I'm know, not, fans I'm of yours. <laughs> but I'm just wondering like, if you have any ideas or if you know of any communities that have cropped up that support these ideas where right. people can come together and so, talk about So I mean, this. all resistance will ultimately be local. So that's why sanctuary is important. And that's why community radio is very important. Um, to be able to, uh, do you have democracy now? And I mean, you know, the, the, we have watched as the ruling elite recognizes that the ideology of neoliberalism is bankrupt. Nobody's buying it across the political spectrum that they have moved quite aggressively 
against anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist critics. So they've done this by accusing us of being agents of a foreign power, um, prop or not, propaganda or not, an anonymous website that was featured on the front page of Bezos's Amazon slash CIA corporation. Uh, I mean, named all major left-wing sites, uh, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch, Alternet, Truthdig, which I write for, as purveyors of foreign propaganda. And when the lawyers for Truthdig asked the editors of the Washington Post who was behind Prop or Not, they said, well, we know, but it's anonymous, but we can't tell you. Okay, we know it is. Um, it's your taxpayer dollars at work. And, the, and so with that charge, we watched Google, Twitter, Facebook impose algorithms. And what they did was that you have something called impressions, where if you had typed in imperialism a year and a half ago, and I had written an article on imperialism, it would come up with anything, other, anything else that was recent on that subject. Now it doesn't. And so you've watched the traffic or the referral from impressions on Truthdig alone decline over the last 12 months from over 700,000 to below 200,000 as they perfect the algorithms. Um, Alternet, for instance, another left-wing site has lost 63% of its traffic. World Socialist website, which is pretty good, has lost over 80% of its traffic. Um, and then you have that coupled with net neutrality. Um, and I have a show, it's called On Contact, it is on RT America, that's Russia today. Why? Because an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist critic cannot get a place even on public broadcasting. If you went back to the late 1960s, early 1970s, you could see on public television Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, it's gone. And, and I'm no fan of Putin, obviously. But I was in Eastern Europe. The only way Czechs could hear the voice of Václav Havel was on Voice of America. Um, and so, and with the abolition of net neutrality, these left-wing sites will be even further tiered, or, or you know, there'll be a two-tiered system on the internet, so they'll be harder and harder to access. And that's because the elites don't have a counter-argument. And so the critics have become much more dangerous uh, and, uh, and, and therefore already marginalized must now be silenced. And we live in a period of relative calm at the moment. Um, so community radio is key. Pacifica is great. Anything that is freed from the tentacles of corporate power and not beholden to wealthy donors. I mean, I've taught at Princeton. Princeton's just a big corporation where a bunch of rich kids or kids who want to be rich go to be branded to get into the 1%. I did, they had a little Occupy uh, movement at Princeton, it was little. <laughs> and they asked me, mostly run by graduate students from Berkeley who'd done their undergraduates at Berkeley. And uh, they asked me to come speak. Well, what I didn't know I was teaching there was that there was a uh, reporter from uh, the Daily Princetonian there. And he did quote me correctly. And the next day the uh, paper said, Ferris professor tells Occupy students that the president of Princeton is an overcompensated fundraiser, that Princeton students are far too deferential to authority, and half of the trustee board should be in prison. But look, it's all true. <laughs> I wasn't invited. Actually, I did teach last year, so I, I think they have a short institutional memory. I don't know. <laughs> Is that it? I think we'll do a book signing before I collapse here. One more? Okay, one more question, then I'll... Oh, is there a line? Oh, oh you were going to go? Go ahead. Okay. Okay, we'll do all of them. We'll do all of them. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Uh, I work for a uh, public employees union, one of the largest in yeah, the great. state. Good. Uh, well, you know, what I have to say is that I'll tell you, we, I worked, personally, I worked for Bernie Sanders. I love Bernie Sanders. But I can tell you that most people in 
most of, and we represent blue and pink collar workers primarily, are very, very much don't believe in the Bernie Sanders uh, agenda. In other words, they think he's pie in the sky. They think it's absolutely absurd what he says. Most of them were not supporting Bernie Sanders. Our union didn't end up in, uh, our union ended up, of course, endorsing Hillary Clinton. Uh, but I guess I'd like you to comment on that because I've seen that with most working, I don't believe that he would have won against Trump because I think he would have been villainized and, and because, Possibly. yeah. yeah. Well, I had a lot of problems with Sanders. Um, I actually spoke to Bernie before he announced. I was with Shama Sawant, the great socialist city councilwoman in Seattle, and we were pushing him to run as an independent. The argument being that one, we're not going to build an effective counterforce in one election cycle. And two, the Democratic Party is never going to give him the nomination. And three, they're going to force him out the door and make him campaign for Hillary Clinton, which is exactly what happened. And I was with uh, Cornell West uh, uh, at, in the streets of Philadelphia. We marched with several thousand homeless people onto the appropriately named Welf Wells Fargo Center, where the Democratic Convention was being held. And then that night, uh, Cornell and I were driving back to Princeton, listening to Bernie's speech endorsing Hillary Clinton. And Cornell, who's amazingly astute, said he missed his historical moment, which meant he should have walked out. But Bernie, when, when Sawan and I pushed him, said, I don't want to end up like Nader. Well, he's not wrong. The Democratic Party would have mounted everything within their power to destroy and marginalize and discredit him as they have with Ralph. And, I, and for me, that was, I'd, I want my career. I want my seniority in the Democratic caucus. Schumer has promised me a committee chairmanship if the Democrats recon take control. I mean, trotting him out, standing behind Chuck Schumer? I mean, Chuck Schumer, the bag man for Wall Street. Uh, the cheerleader for moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. I mean, and I think what will happen, Bernie wants to run again, um, but he ain't going to work because if you look at the crowds he pulled when he was traveling around the country for Clinton, it was in the hundreds instead of 10,000. Um, look, any time you build a radical movement, the oligarchs work overtime to divide the society um, and empower the proto-fascist to carry out acts of violence against the radicals. That is true in, you know, we've seen it. Even in American history, when you look back at the radical unions, the Wobblies, and the use of gun thugs, and Pinkertons, and Baldwin Felts, and company militias, um, so the, the fear, the ruling elites will create the divisions that you talk about, um, but that should not deter us from speaking truth to power. We don't have to speak truth about power. Power knows very well what it's doing. Um, but it will be contentious, and these divisions will be stoked. I mean, we're already watching Trump do it. In terms of the unions... I mean, you look at the teachers' strikes in, like, West Virginia, and they defied their union leadership, who, who, like most union leadership, had become junior partners to the capitalist class. Um, it was quite an amazing moment. So I think we just have to keep speaking to the kind of issues that affect people's lives. I mean, we live in a country where corporations are allowed to hold sick children hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons or daughters. We live in a country where CEOs are pulling down these f compensation packages that are unlike anything we've ever seen in American history, including the Gilded Age. The ec economic disparity, the economic inequality is greater than it has ever been in American history. And workers are still paid substandard wages. So 
I think we have to speak to those issues. We have to try and reach out to people whose politics is not like ours and may even be distasteful, e perhaps even repugnant. Um, but you're, the, the, we will watch the ruling class, and this is true with every ruling class, work very effectively to widen the divisions, stoke the hate, and demonize the radicals. We had the, the, the bloodiest labor wars in any of the industrialized world. Hundreds of American workers were murdered so we could have an eight hour day and an end to child labor. And you know the, the rapaciousness of the American capitalist class is unequaled. And the violence that they inflicted on us in the past, they will inflict on us now. Uh, and, and they will do it by green lighting vigilante groups, uh, which they have always done. I mean, that's why weapons are largely criminalized for people of color. And you walk into a white uh, you know, supporter of Trump's house and he's got an arsenal. That's not by accident. I mean, imagine if Bundy and all those people, imagine if they were black or if they were earth first, what would have happened? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. It is gonna be easy, especially since people don't even speak in the language of class. We don't even have the vocabulary to make sense of what's happening to us. That's, even that's been taken from us. Uh, Chris, we've been going for over an hour with the Q&A, which is awesome. Thank you for your uh, staying power. Uh, there's a few other people left. I'd, I'll leave it to you to decide what to do. I would suggest cutting short at this point because uh, we don't want uh, folks who are interested in the book signing to so leave early. I'm long-winded. That's the problem. <laughs> Nothing compared to Cornell. I do events with Cornell. No, the guy's amazing. I don't know. Like, he stays till the last person's in the room. I'm going, come on, Cornell, we got like a four hour drive. No, no. I just, okay, go. I'll try and keep the answers a little shorter. I didn't know if I was still supposed to come up or. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just wondering about your. I mean, you've spoken a bit about Bernie and about past election and so on, but I'm just wondering about your impressions regarding uh, the Our Revolution group, which is supporting uh, a lot of, um, you know, progressive candidates in the election. I didn't know what you... Well, the Our Revolution, most of the founders of that group uh, resigned in protest. Uh, and look it up, you know, they, they felt Bernie had told it, turned it over to a campaign manager who was a Democratic operative in essence. I mean, one of the things that Bernie did with all his money, which mystified me, was pay, you know, I don't know, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to mainstream Democratic consultants. I, I don't know what the hell that was about. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll try to, I, I guess I'll keep my question brief, although multi-part. One is, uh, I was talking to a friend on the way up here, and one of the uh, issues with voting, we've had so much voter suppression, and it seems like they've been working forever, like a hundred and some years, but it doesn't seem like the Democrats really, even though that would help them get elected, really fight for it. They might talk about it, but are the, Democrats, are, the, are the Democrats complicit in some way? Second question, and again, you can keep your answer short. Um, you know, the, so the first one was, hey, do the Democrats really not really want to, are they kind of like, you know, enabling, intentionally sold out to the powers that be? Second question uh, is if, um, if Pence were to get uh, to be president, do you think he would marshal kind of the religious right in the way that Trump has the uh, white nationalists to where it actually grow versus, uh, you know, the counterforce where people go, hey, this is too crazy. We're out of here. Well, the Democrats suppressed lots of votes in New York State in the primary, um, over 300,000. So uh, they also, uh, in the primaries, refused to allow in many primaries independents to vote who weren't registered Democrats most young people who supported Sanders. So they will suppress the vote as energetically as the Republican Party when it serves their interests. Um, and what was the second question? Getting late. No, Pence is truly terrifying because he's a rational fascist. Um, and he comes out of the infrastructure. Would he coalesce with these people, though? Like, increase them? 
Yeah. I mean, he would, he, we already, I mean, Trump's already doing it. I mean, Kavanaugh, the reason there was this huge effort to put Kavanaugh on the court is because the Christian right, I mean, in watching uh, Collins, a Maine, pretend that Kavanaugh is open to seeing Roe v. Wade as settled, I mean, this is ridiculous. The whole reason he was pushed on there is because he's going to revoke Roe v. Wade and because he's corporate friendly. But the Christian right was pushing hard, made it very clear to tr the Trump administration they had to put him on. So, I mean, the, Pence's entire political career has been funded by the Koch brothers. Um, he's a really dangerous guy. And yeah, he will, now whether he will have the cultish aspect of Trump, I don't know. But he certainly has these Christian fascists behind him. Is that it? Okay. Thank you.